examine the facts. Gladio, was the code name for a clandestine NATO, stay behind, operation in Europe during the Cold War, structured to continue anti-communist actions in the event of a Soviet invasion and conquest, initially originating in Italy over the fear of the spread of communism there. The Italian word Gladius, is a type of Roman sword, that is found on Operation Gladio's logo. Operation Gladio appropriated the motto, Silendo Libertatum Servo. Serving liberty silently. Formed in 1956, its existence remained a secret until 1991, when it was first revealed by Italian Prime Minister Giulio Andriotti. The alleged link between the Priory of Sion and Operation Gladio involves two factors. Pierre Plantard co-founded the Priory of Sion in 1956, the same time Operation Gladio was formed. The other factor involves Philippe de Chayarizzi's friendship with Sean O'Driscoll, 1915-1991, who worked for NATO. The 1956 Priory of Sion was a regional unofficial housing association in the small French town of Anmus, which existed as a protest group against the official local government authority. It produced a newsletter called The Circuit, consisting of stapled A4 sheets of paper containing stenciled writing, that functioned as a platform for complaints about things such as the state of water meters. The 1956 Priory of Sion also arranged voluntary initiatives, for example, and organized a free school bus service. There was nothing of a political or military nature about the 1956 Priory of Sion. The Philippe de Chayarizzi factor involves the cover of his 1971 unpublished document, Circuit, showing a gladio, and his friendship with Sean O'Driscoll, Colonel John Joffrey Driscoll, USAF, who according to his wife, was the godfather of Philippe de Chayarizzi's son. A former bomber pilot in World War II, by the 1950s O'Driscoll had become the American head of the NATO Mutual Weapons Development Program, MWDP, in Paris. In 1981, he bought and restored Castle Matrix in Ireland. O'Driscoll was interested in folklore and allegedly co-founded the Irish Heraldry Society, which ceased to exist decades ago. He allegedly belonged to the Shikshini Order of St. John. One acquaintance described O'Driscoll as, a mad renaissance man, who collected not only an astounding library but incredible artifacts. The major problem linking the Priory of Sion with Operation Gladio lies in the name itself, the French parallel network was named, Glaive, a kind of spear. Keep in mind that Operation Gladio had different names in different countries. For example, in Greece, it was called Operation Sheepskin. The second problem lies in the fact that there is no solid evidence that Sean O'Driscoll held any interest in the Priory of Sion, his name is not mentioned anywhere in the Priory of Sion literature, and this suggests he held no such interest, only that he knew Philippe de Chayarizzi as a friend through a shared common interest in heraldry and folklore. In conclusion, this is another off-the-mark conspiracy theory lacking any substantial evidence to attract any worthwhile interest. Really, these words written anonymously don't seem to match my own experiences in the Shikshini Order of St. John. An order of Orthodox Knights of Malta which I recently joined, initiated by the Italian governor Don Salvo Francesco Caligaro, and prior to that with the Monte Carlo P2 Lodge, where I was a prominent member from 1999 to 2006. I often had contact with senior members of both the P2 Lodge, such as Ezio Ginciglia, for example, and the Priory of Sion, with key figures like Gino Sandri, Planter Zaire, and Jean-Pierre Giudicelli, who also claimed many past links and friendship with the brothers of Lissio Gelli's infamous Masonic organization in the 1970s and 80s, at a time when I was too young to have a direct involvement with these circles of power. The P2 attempted to act as a transnational lodge, even without reaching its desired international goals, because of an alleged link with an even more powerful and influential transnational Masonic lodge called Three Eyes Lodge, once directed by the late David Rockefeller, that included Henry Kissinger among its founders. This information was confirmed directly to me by Ginciglia in my years as a historian for the Monte Carlo Lodge, and is confirmed by a document which recently surfaced in the Italian book Masons, Unlimited Responsibility Company, the discovery of the Ur Lodges, by the previously mentioned past worshipful master of the Har Zion Montegian Lodge No. 705. In Rome, Joel Magaldi. In this document, you will find a letter addressed by Gelli to various worshipful masters in Europe and the US. He mentions William Childs Westmoreland, March 26, 1914 to July 18, 2005, who was the United States Army's four-star general in command of all U.S. military operations during the Vietnam War between 1964 to 1968, and the supposed creator of U.S. Army Field Manual 30 to 31B. 
a document that the U.S. government and academic sources still describe to this day as a forgery three because this document hides the darkest side of U.S. policies abroad, as it describes top-secret counterinsurgency tactics. In particular, it identifies a strategy of tension involving violent attacks that are then blamed on radical left-wing groups, in order to convince allied governments of the need for counteraction, a bit like they do these days with ISIS and Al-Qaeda. Kelly even mentions the letter field manual, as he calls it, a guidebook directing his own work and force of action. He, in fact, writes that Westmoreland was an active Masonic member of three important or transnational lodges working behind the scenes in those years, Three Eyes, Leviathan, and Gevora. I hope U.S. citizens who are reading this, knowing also that Lucio Gelli is no bullshitter, will take the necessary steps to find out from their government the truth behind this infamous field manual and the P-2 Lodge operations they financed in secret in the last decades of the so-called Cold War. Going back to the Priory of Sion, this French order with a seemingly pragmatic approach, and actually inspired by the more deviant side of French Rosicrucianism. In 1989, Plantard himself will claim that Georges Monti was the real inspiration for the order. Yes, the same Monti I mentioned earlier who became involved with the Ordo Templi Orientis, and who threw it met Alistair Crowley, the self-styled, Beast 666. So, the Priory was deeply involved in esoteric and magical practices, acting to this day as a shadowy Neo-Templar group, operating within the European Illuminati's elite and certain transnational lodges linked to the Vatican, Freemasonry, and the secret paramilitary structures established during the Cold War around Europe, all within the stay behind. Operation 4, which includes the previously mentioned Italian Gladio. In this context, we find the knowledge of the esoteric and metaphysical world, not only in the religious realm. This is a result of the profound interest in the esoteric tradition, usually expressed by many European political leaders of the extreme right that has always been secretly involved with the Priory of Sion, or similar orders of the Neo-Templar world. Nowadays, in Greece, the leading right-wing party is called the Golden Dawn. If this name sounds familiar, it is no coincidence. We learn more about the esoteric knowledge involving the Priory by extracting some interesting passages from the book, Pour la Rose Rouge et la Croix d'Or, published for the first time at the end of the 80s in France, written by the political right-wing activist and occultist Jean-Pierre Giudicelli de Cressic Boccolari, a high-level Freemason, involved in the Supreme Council of the Priory of Sion now operating as Association Alpha International. This seemingly new age organization has an internal Masonic circle called the Ordre Machinique Hermitique and is based in the French city of Montpellier. These facts correspond with the interesting revelations made in circuit written by Philippe Chayarizzi, the 9th Marquis de Chayarizzi, the 13th of February 1923 to the 17th of July 1985, who is best known for his creation of fake parchments published in the 1967 book, L'Or de Rennes, by Gérard de Cive, and his involvement in the Priory of Sion hoax between 1962-1983. All this plus the various speculations on the possible role of the Priory in the murders of Princess Grace of Monaco and Princess Diana, but as a disclaimer, I will address these subjects as a curiosity, because of the lack of factual evidence. In the third and final part of this chapter, I will discuss the secret connection between the mysterious symbol found in the alchemical masterpiece Orium Seculum Redivivum. Written by Henricus Modatanus, aka Adrian von Minsick, 1603-1638, and Porta Alchemica. English, Alchemical Door, also known as the Alchemy Gate or Magic Portal of the Marquis of Palombara, based in Rome. It would appear they were connected to Berenger Sonnier, who became the parish priest of Rennes Lecato in 1885 and is probably one of the key figures in the modern myth connected to the Priory of Sion. So let's go beyond the tall tales of Dan Brown, and instead, explore the real mysteries of the Priory of Sion. Here we will discover a modern knighthood structure with many military, religious and political connections and implications, which was actually founded by Pierre Plantard in France in the 1950s, long after Saunier died. It has a long esoteric history that connects it to Abbé Saunier, who was himself, a Rosicrucian. The Priory, in fact, demonstrates a connection to an ancient mystery school, which saw both Saunier and Plantard in their fold, also, of course, Rosicrucian. This, invisible college, is always present in Neo-Templar Masonic rites, another subject I will touch upon further in relation to Sonier. In 1999, Liz Driscoll, who also goes by O'Driscoll Elizabeth Forrest, wrote an online article called The Green Man of Ireland and Scotland and revealed that her husband, Sean Driscoll, Colonel John Joffrey Driscoll, USAF, had met Philippe Shearizy and was also the godfather of his son, Gaspard Shearizy. 
Liz Driscoll wrote, then halfway through the book, they mentioned Philippe de Chayarizi, their one main contemporary source of information and when I mentioned his name to my late husband, Sean looked really taken aback and blurted out, but I know him. It turned out that Sean was the godfather of Philippe's only son, who is now a marquee. Whatever my husband was involved in, he never revealed to me, as all male members of the Grail families and their male supporters were pledged to complete secrecy about their family roots on pain of death. Sean Driscoll was a fighter pilot during World War II, and in 1950 he became the head of the NATO Mutual Weapons Development Program, MWDP, in Paris. In 1981, he bought and restored a castle in Ireland. General Charles de Gaulle withdrew France from NATO in 1966 and, because of this sudden decision, the Supreme Headquarters Allied Powers Europe, SHAPE, had to relocate its headquarters from Paris to a place near Brussels. SHAPE was the directing organ of NATO's military apparatus and coordinated the actions of Gladio, the main European, Stabahin, anti-communist operation after the Second World War, whose existence became known only in 1990. France did not really disband its stay-behind army despite it breaking free from NATO. The author of Circuit, Philippe Chayarizi, was involved in this secret struggle. There seems to be, in fact, a direct historical connection between the Priory of Sion and the military intelligence services of NATO from the beginning of Pierre Plantard's operation. This connection provided a link for Philippe Chayarizi with information on Operation Gladio and what was really going on in Europe behind the scenes back in those days some of these truths were apparently filtered in the form of a novel in an unpublished edition of Circuit. From 1971, which seems to be of great importance in reference to the symbolism expressed on the cover and some of the content. Keep in mind what I mentioned earlier, the French style. Full of intrigue and ancient mystery but always hidden behind a veil of secrecy. The sword on the cover is, in fact, a Roman sword, which refers to, Operation Gladio. And the novel by Philippe Chayarizi is about the hunt for an ancient Roman treasure with the characters, Charlotte and Madeleine, who were, off the beautiful ruin, guardian of the sword. Jean-Pierre Giudicelli once told me during a meeting in San Remo, Italy, that this ancient Roman treasure really exists, and is of great importance to the various modern emanations of the Priory of Sion. He said it was hidden away close to the well-known shrine of Rennes-le-Château in France, a place notoriously connected to the Priory's legend. You may be familiar with this town thanks to Dan Brown's novel, The Da Vinci Code, and a couple of decades earlier in the book by Michael Bajan, Richard Lee, and Henry Lincoln that hardly inspired Brown in his writing endeavors entitled, The Holy Blood and the Holy Grail, Holy Blood, Holy Grail. In the United States, like many old European communities, Rennes-le-Château has a complex history. It is the site of a prehistoric settlement, and later a Roman villa or temple, which was built in the nearby town of Fa from the Latin word phantom meaning, in fact, temple, based only 9 kilometers from Rennes-le-Château. Giudicelli said the mysterious location where this legendary treasure was hidden was the town of Fa, or at least near there. Should we believe him? Well, if you're ever in the area, it wouldn't hurt to take a look. The novel by Philippe Chayarizi, present in the publication circuit, is divided into 22 chapters, the title of each chapter connected to one of the major arcana of the tarot. Under this esoteric cover, it contains information regarding secret military intelligence activities conducted in those years by NATO. On the sword of Chayarizi is handwritten the name, Saint Ursin, the saint in question is the patron saint of Borges in central France, located in the center of the hexagram shown on the cover of the book. The Bishop of Borges during the Merovingian period was Street, Sulpus, Saint Ursin and Saint, Sulpus are both mentioned in a chapter of Circuit. In the fictional novel, Lulu du Serpent Rouge by Jean-Paul Burr published in 2004, Patrice Villard is mentioned as one of the Grand Masters of the Priory of Sion. Patrice was the pseudonym of François Durand de Grassouber, an advisor to Mitterrand, and one of the commanders of Gladio for the Lyon region of France until his alleged suicide in Paris on April 7, 1994. Perhaps when certain Cold War figures were no longer needed or knew too much, death was always the best option. Grassover was not only linked to the Priory of Sion, but also to the nefarious cult of the Order of the Solar Temple, which involved Princess Grace Kelly of Monaco. Grace joined the Order of the Solar Temple a few months before her death in 1982. For some researchers, this was one of the main reasons behind her possible murder, camouflaged as an accident. It is a tale that is sadly similar to Princess Diana, in Paris many years later. The Order of the Solar Temple, also known as Ordre du Temple Solaire, OTS, was a secret society based upon the existence and ideals of the Knights Templar, just as with the Priory of Sion. 
It gained international attention as a result of a series of mass murders and suicides that involved the members of this dangerous sect, which occurred in Switzerland and in Quebec in 1994, in France in 1995, and again in Quebec in 1997. The group's history can be traced well back before the 1990s. The group was founded officially by Jody Mambro and Luke Jorid in Geneva in 1984 as L'Ordre International Chevaleresque de Tradition Solaire. OICTS, and renamed Ordre du Temple Solaire. Some historians allege that the Solar Temple originates with French author Jacques Breyer cited earlier by Judicelli, who established a sovereign order of the Solar Temple in 1952. In 1968, a schismatic order was renamed the Renewed Order of the Solar Temple. Rots, under the leadership of French right-wing political activist Julian Origas.21. As you can see, right-wing activism goes hand-in-hand hand with neo-Templarism, especially in France, where the already-mentioned Georges Monti was inspirational for people like Breyer, or more recently, Judicelli. In any case, it was Jacques Breyer, one of the main proponents of the French neo-Templar revival of the 1950s, that some say suggested to the leaders of the OTS, in the period between 1983 and 1984, that they create various inside structures within the group that would help establish and spread their ideology to reinforce its concrete actions. Three structures were subsequently created in the OTS, with different functions, which were very active in the period between 1984 to approximately 1990. This underlines the great importance of Jacques Breyer's organizational skills and cultural influence in the expansion of their knighthood organization at an international level. Their huge success in this area attracted the likes of the late Grace Kelly. This was until the tragic turning point in the mid-1990s, which demonstrated to the world the true nature of this insane cult that drew inspiration for its crazy teachings from none other than Aleister Crowley, who else? Wikipedia noted the Order of the Solar Temple, the group reportedly drew some inspiration for its teachings from British occultist Aleister Crowley. One day, in the Monte Carlo Lodge, I overheard a story told by a friend of Gino Sandri of the Priory of Sion. He was a French Freemason involved in both the Grand Priory of Gauls, a French Masonic obedience practicing the rectified Scottish Rite, and the Priory of Sion. He was introduced to me as a relative of the French Minister of Justice at the time. He spoke of the murder of Princess Diana, and how he heard she was killed by an elite group of professional killers of the French military intelligence operating under orders given by the British MI6, and coordinated by a secret group called the Alpha Gallets. This group was established back in the 1930s by Pierre Plantard, but most brothers present that day in the small principality of Monaco assumed it was no longer in existence. The fact that this French Freemason was actually involved with the rectified Scottish Rite struck me as not only interesting but in line with the short history of both the Priory of Sion and the possible survival of the mysterious Alpha Gallets. As some experts, like the French research group called Societe Parallos, have stated in the past, the Alpha Gallets was part of the rectified Scottish Rite. Their research concluded that, the Alpha Gallets was part of the Grande Loge du Rite Rectifié and was, therefore, a Masonic Order. Another interesting discovery made by the Societe Parallos is the fact that Plantard's family doctor, who is said to have introduced him to the infamous George Monty back in 1934, was the influential Freemason called Camille Savoir, a grand officer of the Grand Priory of Gauls, who became involved with the Masonic Reformation of the Grande Loge Symbolique Écossais, or the Great Scottish Symbolic Lodge, and was a Knights Beneficent of the Holy City. So the link is definitely there from the beginning, between Plantard and the Priory of Gauls, and the rich history of the rectified Scottish Rite that had, amongst its members, Francois Berenger Saunier, the Roman Catholic priest of Rennes-le-Château. Camille Savoir was like Monty, someone secretly operating on behalf of the Catholics for a reorganization of Freemasonry under their own terms. It seems to have had an enormous influence on the young Plantard who witnessed, in 1936, the premature death of George Monty. He died quite young at the age of 56, and he is believed to have been poisoned a few days after a bulletin in the journal of the rival Grand Law de France that had denounced him as an imposter and a Jesuit spy, and proclaimed he was indeed raised by the Jesuits. The Alpha Gallets was created, at least in the mind of Plantard, during these turbulent times. The Statutes of the Alpha Gallets were said to have been deposited on the 21st of September, 1942, officially describing itself as a tripartite order composed of the Temple, Le Cité, and Les Arches. The Alpha Gallets was mentioned by Claude Charlotte of the Paris Police Prefecture on a CBS News 60 Minutes. 
documentary, according to a police report on the Alpha Gallets. Dated the 13th of February 1945, at the most, the organization was only composed of 50 members, who resigned one after the another as soon as they sized up the president of the association, Pierre Plantard, and realized that it was not a serious enterprise. Point two two. Did they really leave? Was the organization really disbanded? Or is it, instead, a Masonic organization still in existence? Why did Plantard still have six of them acting as founding members of the Priory of Sion, 11 years later? The story I heard in Monte Carlo by this brother regarding Princess Diana might be a liar pure disinfo, but the connection with the Priory and French military intelligence, as well as the link with the rectified Scottish Rite and the Grand Priory of Gauls GPDG, has been proven time and time again during my 20 years of research. The real Priory of Sion was indeed founded in the 1950s in France, and not in a remote time in history to protect some mind-blowing secret that could change Christianity. At the same time, this order of Catholic chivalry, was not the insignificant regional unofficial housing association present in the small French town of Anmus, portrayed wrongly by some critics. The importance of this Catholic fringe fraternal organization, founded by Pierre Plantard, to the usual controllers of the system hidden in their transnational or lodges, was clear from the start, and their intelligence headquarters included the Jesuit intelligence headquarters in Aspatia, holding the biggest intelligence archive in the world. The Priory was created, like many other Catholic organizations, to fit the anti-communist agenda of the time, so dear to the US and its NATO allies. The origins of Plantard's Priory can be found in the European youth campaign of those years. As La Société Perillos reported, youth movements were a social preoccupation of the first half of the 20th century. They were very important to Hitler and Stalin, but they had an equally important role to play in the West. After World War II, they were often seen as perfect recruiting or training grounds for upcoming politicians. What happened to youth movements before, during, and after the Second World War is an often neglected field of study, but though less popular, its history is well documented. And it is here that we need to look to find details of the framework in which Plantard was operating. In 1947, the Soviet-funded international youth movement, called the World Federation of Democratic Youth WFDY, was shaken by the division that went with the Cold War. The WFDY soon began to splinter, leaving the right-wing and social democrats with no natural home. To fill the void, the British National Council of Social Service, chaired by Sir George Haynes, agreed to organize a preparatory committee, chaired by Haynes, to launch a complementary youth body. Equally, European Federalists had plans for a major youth campaign, but the financial means were not at hand, and the realization of the project was, initially, indefinitely postponed. In a rare instance of not showing its usual greed, substantial British government funds were made available for a conference to be held in mid-1948. Three quarters of the £12,000 budget was covered by government departments, including £3,000 from a bogus Prime Minister's South African Aid to Britain Fund, which appears to have been a cover for funds from the secret vote. Covert funding was also received from the French government. The success of the conference resulted in the creation of the World Assembly of Youth. Way, with headquarters in Paris. But there is more. In 1954, the CIA began covert financing of the international student movement mainly to aid the right, with MI6 and the CIA who helped organize and fund Way. As they had headquarters in Paris, it is likely the money had to find its way pun intended to Paris too. Only a person ignorant of the knowledge of certain matters can be confused by the reality surrounding the real Priory of Sion. Even the initiatic connection that Sean Driscoll shared with Philippe de Cherisane is pretty normal in this environment. The former NATO officer was especially interested in esoteric subjects and folklore, as all the Illuminati usually are. He was described as, a lover of the Renaissance, that not only had an amazing library, but also amazing artifacts. The Illuminati are usually very passionate about ancient artifacts, just as the members of Planters Priory or the Jesuits have always been. The previously mentioned group of thieves saw the participation of Jean-Pierre Judicelli and other members of the infamous Priory of Sion in their attempted, on an herb style project. It is said that Driscoll also belonged to the Orthodox Knights of Malta of the SOSJ, sometimes referred to as the Chicxuni Knights of Malta, due to the order's longtime headquarters based in Chicxuni, Pennsylvania, after 1933. This is another order I know personally very well, as I have been nominated commander for the U.S. by the main Italian branch. This order has a long rich history of involvement within the intelligence community at an international level of great interest for researchers like myself, who are interested in the world of knighthoods and secret orders. 
Like the SMOM, this knightly order claims descent from the original Knights Hospitallers, but via the Russian line of succession that was originally formed at the time of Paul I Emperor of Russia, between 1796 and 1801. The deal that gave birth to this Russian line of succession was the following, described in official documents. In terms of the Russian Priory, the convention of 4th to 5th of January 1797, between Emperor Paul I and the Grand Master of the Order Ferdinand von Hompesch which founded the Grand Priory of Russia, was an international contractual act, and its terms were forever. Also, no imperial ukase was ever issued abrogating Paul I's proclamation which created a Russian Order of Saint John, which was not only promulgated, in his name, but in that of our successors forever. The order in Russia was maintained by its commanders and knights. It was officially reconstituted at the famous Waldorf Astoria in New York in 1908, with the formation of the Grand Priory of America. This is thanks to Grand Duke Alexander Mikhailovich, 1866-1933, who was the brother-in-law of the last Emperor of Russia Nicholas II, who strongly desired the creation of this priory in the U.S. as a safety net for the Russian aristocracy and its Orthodox Church. Since the earlier revolution of 1905, both were under attack. Over a decade later, on the 17th of July 1918, Nicholas II and his family were condemned to death by the Ural Soviet of Workers' Deputies. The supposed war on communism had begun for the Orthodox Knights of Malta present in the U.S., which became another global game full of smoke and mirrors and strange deals created in the usual transnational or lodges. A game that reached the final, well-crafted stage, in the New World Order with the fall of the Berlin Wall in 1989. These claims regarding the real origins of the order are often indicated as highly dubious by some critics and historians, who are operating on behalf of the Vatican SMOM. In any case, these researchers don't have access to the archives of the order that are hidden, at the moment, in the Italian city of Bologna, Italy, for safekeeping. We must keep in mind that the longtime Grand Chancellor, and the then Secretary Treasurer of the Order, Colonel Charles L. Thorat Pickle, were often criticized and wrongly indicated by some as the sole inventors of this knighthood, which has always had the patronage of the Romanov family for this project. This is something you can't obtain by simply paying money or falsifying documents, as the Romanovs were a family of the last emperor and autocrat of all the Russias. Interestingly enough, Pickle himself was also suspected of having ties to Nazi intelligence during World War II. He even boasted of it in the post-war era, probably knowing that such connections were judged in a positive light by both the Russian aristocracy and U.S. intelligence in the period following the war that saw the rise of anti-communism and the Cold War mentality promulgated by the New World Order establishment. By the late 1950s, the Shikshini Knights of Malta began not only to attract the usual Russian aristocrats and the Orthodox clergy that helped establish the U.S. Grand Priory of the Order in the earlier years, but also several former high-ranking military U.S. officers, and even a few important CIA assets, into its membership roles. This served at times to act as a sort of secret meeting ground between intelligence operatives of various nations helping the U.S. in their struggle against communism. Most notable, was Major General Charles Willoughby, Douglas MacArthur's longtime chief of intelligence in the Far East, whom MacArthur referred to as, my little fascist. In the wake of World War II, Willoughby became involved with the Yakuza, and Japan's secret organization called Kinmo Yuri, or the Golden Lily, who were involved in smuggling gold and other precious metals that were looted by Imperial Japan during the war. Some of this loot was later hidden in underground vaults in the Philippines, and have, in the last few years, become an interesting topic for conspiracy theorists in search of a cheap thrill, such as Benjamin Fulford, who propose improbable ways to save the financial system using this hidden gold. In the books, The Yamato Dynasty, The Secret History of Japan's Imperial Family 2000, and Gold Warriors, America's Secret Recovery of Yamashita's Gold 2003, the authors Sterling Seagrave and Peggy Seagrave contend that looting was organized on a massive scale by both Yakuza, gangsters such as Yoshio Kodama, and the highest levels of Japanese society, including Emperor Hirohito. During the Korean War, Willoughby and MacArthur would also be involved in the establishment of civil air transport, Air America, sometimes referred to as Air Opium, giving Willoughby ample contacts in organized crime, as well as access to vast sums of black market gold. In 1955, a few years after his retirement from the military, Willoughby offered his services to Alan Dulles and the CIA, even despite his public loathing for the agency. A year later, Willoughby became involved in the formation of what would become known as the World Anti-Communist League, WACL. 
Willoughby and MacArthur helped establish its Asian component, the Asian People's Anti-Communist League, APACL, during the late 1940s and early 1950s. In the early 1960s, Philip J. Corso, May 22, 1915 to July 16, 1998, who earned the rank of Lieutenant Colonel in the United States Army, was involved in Army Intelligence. Corso is a figure still very popular amongst ufologists for his alleged involvement in the research of extraterrestrial technology, and who co-authored, with Bill Byrne, the groundbreaking book The Day After Roswell, and was a member of the Armed Services Committee of the Chicxini Knights of Malta. In 1956, Corso worked with West German paramilitary units connected to the spy network of former Nazi master spy chief Reinhard Galen. The Order's Armed Services Committee was full of retired military types with ultra-rightist sympathies including generals from the MacArthur Circle such as Bonner Fellers and Pedro del Valle. The committee also included British Admiral Sir Barry Dombill, who was identified by the English as a Nazi agent and jailed during World War II. According to Peter Dale Scott, after the Kennedy assassination, both Corso and Frank Coppale, another Shikshini Knight and an editor for the John Birch Society, were instrumental in spreading stories linking Oswald to Russia and Ruby to Castro's Cuba. Psychological warfare and propaganda, including, of course, disinfo, operations, were the main areas of interest for these global manipulators working for the committee during the Cold War, the biggest psychological operation ever supported by the new nuclear threat. Brother Henry Kissinger of the Three Eyes Lodge, and a key figure of the Bohemian Grove writes in his book with the appropriate title, World Order, the Cold War International Order reflected two set of balances which for the first time in history were largely independent of each other, the nuclear balance between the Soviet Union and the United States, and the international balance within the Atlantic Alliance, whose operation was in important ways, psychological. Keeping this in mind, I can say with certainty that Sean O'Driscoll, known also as Colonel John Joffrey Driscoll of the USAF working for NATO, fits the mold of a guy involved in this controversial Maltese order connected to the US military-industrial complex, which Eisenhower warned us about. In March 2014, at the Italian headquarters of the Chicxini Knights of Malta, I personally saw a very elaborate and genuine document from the Priory of Sion recently addressed to them, and signed by a mysterious knight using the nickname of an animal, an initiatic tradition in use within the Priory of Sion since the time of Pierre Plantard. In any case, people in France of intelligence and culture, with positions of high responsibility within society, politics and the military, have been part of Plantard's Priory of Sion since the 1950s. That is why I can establish that the real Priory of Sion, created by Pierre Plantard, St. Clair, a.k.a. Chirin, was nothing more than the French version of the P2 Lodge of Lysio Gelli. Operating for the Stay Behind Network, of which the most famous was indeed Operation Gladio, that saw the direct involvement of the Priory of Sion, as Judicelli himself admitted. The real Priory of Sion was officially created by Plantard Sinclair on June 25, 1956, with a regular recording in the prefecture of the French town of saint julien en genevois which later announced in an official bulletin printed on July 20, 1956, that it is not an order opposed to the Vatican created in secret to protect the lineage of Christ, as claimed by Dan Brown in his fictional tale, but a deeply Catholic order, at least on the surface, created to fight communism and to serve the NATO alliance and its new world order during the Cold War years. Interestingly enough, the Priory of Sion has survived the end of the Cold War and is still in existence to this day, with an influential chapter in the business district of Wall Street, in the economic heart of the USA, demonstrating that Plantard's fantastic tales and structure still survive after his death in the year 2000. Like the Alpha Gallets before them, the Priory was set up by Plantard with a legion, a phalange, and a hierarchy of nine grades. One member is, at the highest level, but not only are three in the next level down, nine in the next, and so on, each level down having three times the number of that above, so that there should always be 9,841 members in total. I would also like to add that the 33rd degree of the ancient and accepted Scottish Rite is required to join the inner circle of the Priory of Sion in France, currently in the hands of Gino Sandri and Jean-Pierre Giudicelli. These individuals belong to an invisible college of the Rosicrucian tradition, whose practices predate Christianity itself, and who are linked to the aristocracy and the dominating elite of this planet since time immemorial. What's more, they are often operating beyond the common knowledge of time and space, for the invisible masters, those extra-dimensional beings we commonly refer to as aliens. 
Finally, I would like to use this last sub-chapter dedicated to the Priory of Sion to present research regarding a specific symbol and its relation to Francois Berenger Saunier, the 11th of April 1852 to the 22nd of January 1917, the famous Roman Catholic priest involved in the Priory of Sion myth. This research began with my interest in a curious bookplate which appeared in the book The Tomb of God, 1996, a speculative non-fictional book written by Richard Andrews and Paul Schellenberger. The object was reportedly found in Rennes le Chateau in the early 90s. So what is a bookplate? A bookplate, also known as Sex Libris in Latin, is usually a small print or decorative label pasted into a book, often on the inside front cover, to indicate its owner. In their work, Andrews and Schellenberger make the extraordinary claim that the bones of Jesus were removed in the 12th century and now lay buried in southwestern France. They wrote, We have come to the conclusion that Mount Cardo is the last resting place of the remains of Jesus Christ, God on earth, it is, in fact, the tomb of God. Of course, such an extravagant theory, to say the least, is not taken seriously by most academic scholars. A BBC Two Time Watch documentary entitled, The History of a Mystery, which aired in September 1996, was based on the subjects of this book during the Dan Brown frenzy, and questioned some of the evidence brought forward by the authors. Nevertheless, it seems reasonable for a number of reasons to assume that this mysterious bookplate found by the two authors, indeed belonged to Sonier, as the two authors have claimed. It's wrong to assume however that the curious design found on the bookmark was invented by Sonier, or by a designer using his notes to create it. This wrong deduction made by the two writers is probably due to their lack of experience in the esoteric field, something I want to correct with my own expertise in this case. The reproduction of the bookplate that can be found on page 182 of the Tomb of God. 31. Consists of two triangles that form the seal of Solomon in a circle along with several other geometrical figures surrounded by Latin text. The letters BS are predominant on this bookplate, probably the reason why the two authors, with no further research, thought it was simply an esoteric creation of Berenger Sonier, or at least of his imagination, making no further inquiries into the curious object. In reality, the same symbol appears in an enigmatic monument in Rome called Porta Alchemica, or in English, the Alchemical Door, also known as the Alchemy Gate or Magic Portal, that still holds great importance for the Illuminati. This door, now sealed forever is the only survivor of the five gates built in Villa Palambara, engraved with symbols and riddles. It still remains covered with phrases and symbols of alchemy and hermeticism and is located within the remains of the walls of Villa Palambara in Piazza Vittorio in Rome. The villa was built by the Marquis Massimiliano Palambara, the Marquis of Petrofort, and other passionate scholars of the esoteric world operating within the Illuminati of that era known as the Golden Rosicross. One of the legends involving the Porta Alchemica states that the construction of this strange villa included participation of the famous Gian Lorenzo Bernini, also a key figure with his creations in Dan Brown's Angels and Demons, and his mentor, the Jesuit Athanasius Kircher, a famous master of alchemy and a pioneer in Egyptology who strongly influenced the Jesuits and the Illuminati. It seems reasonable to assume that Sonier borrowed the design for his bookplate from the drawing that originally inspired the project of the Marquis Massimiliano Palambara, a drawing that appeared on the title page of a book called Orium Seculum Redivivum, by Henricus Modatanus, a pseudonym of Hadrian A. Minsic, 1603-1638. This particular drawing, present on the pediment of the Porta Alchemica, has two triangles that overlap in an inscription in Latin, and it appears almost exactly the same as on the title page of the posthumous edition of this book published in 1677. The original version of 1621 seems, in fact, to be very different, but the design that inspired the Marquis Palambara instead appear exactly one year before they began construction of the villa in 1678. We can't be 100% certain, but the legend I mentioned above states that between 1678 and 1680, with Athanasius Kircher and Bernini, there was the dark, shady legendary figure called Bori, aka Giustiniani Bono, ex-seminarist of the Jesuits turned prophet and magician, who helped with the construction of the Porta Alchemica in Palambara's villa. From my own research in various archives of the church, this seems indeed to be the case. Of course, all this makes for a fascinating story and provides an incredible background for the Porta Alchemica, that if confirmed true, or even partially true, should attract the curiosity of historians and visitors from all over the world to this site. Strangely enough, these days, the site of the magical door is completely ignored by both the academic world and the tourists that generally visit Rome. It lies abandoned in the east of the city on Esquilino Hill. 
there is another important legend connected to this mysterious place that seems to be more symbolic than anything else. The story recounts that Marquis Massimiliano Palambara, who was a friend of Queen Christine of Sweden, enjoyed the company of alchemists and astrologers. One day, a young alchemist, Giuseppe Francesco Bori, asked the Marquis for permission to use her laboratory. He said that the art of making gold was not impossible. Bori locked himself up in the laboratory a day and a night. In the morning, the Marquis had the door smashed in. Bori had fled by a window, only leaving behind a crucible with a little solid gold inside and a few scrolls covered with strange symbols. The scrolls were studied, but no one could figure out what they meant. Marquis Palambara had the symbols carved on the gates so that future alchemists could study them. The secret of the Philosopher's Stone was lost forever or perhaps used by Bori, himself. It's amazing, the similarity between portraits of Bori and the mysterious Count of Saint. German. Since this symbol originates in a Rosicrucian context, we are inclined to believe Sanir was a part of this fraternity. Of course, no record of a Sanir membership in the Rosicrucians or Freemasonry has ever surfaced within public view. This is pretty normal for a Catholic priest who can't admit or declare his Masonic or Rosicrucian membership, especially back in those days. So how did Sanir, the priest of Rennes le Chateau, discover this alchemical design that we find reproduced on page 182 of the book The Tomb of God? Fig. 59, in 1802, an abbot named Francis Jerome Clerks wrote a quick guide, in Italian, of his studies about the inscriptions on the alchemical door in Rome. This work was later translated into French by Peter Bournier and appeared in the April, June 1895 edition of L'Initiation, a philosophical journal of higher education. A copy arrived in the hands of Sanir, and this, together with his own particular obsession for Henricus Modathanas Aurium Seculum Redivivum appears to be the main inspiration for the symbol on his personal bookplate. Significantly enough, Modathanas ends the text of his book by saying that he is indeed a Frater Ore Crucis. However, in Golden Age Restored, Orium Seculum Redivivum, by Henricus Modathanas, there appears, hidden, an even more influential role in the New World Order. The motto Orium Seculum Redivivum and Novus Ordo Seclorum, present in the Great Seal of the United States, is a motto also used by the Bavarian Illuminati, partial heirs of 17th century Rosicrucianism. In 1782, the Great Seal of the United States demonstrated a version of the symbol created earlier by the Rosicrucian Hadrian A. Minsicht this time with the eye at the top of the pyramid. Fig. 62, in this context we should ponder the words of Professor Charles Eliot Norton, November 16, 1827 to October 21, 1908, from Harvard University, and cited by Masonic author Manly P. Hall in his influential book The Secret Teachings of All Ages not only were many of the founders of the government of the United States Masons, but they received aid from a secret August group stationed in Europe, which helped them to establish this country for a peculiar and particular purpose known only to the initiated few. So what was this, August group, stationed in Europe, the Illuminati? The Rosicrucians, or both under a common banner. Jean-Pierre Giudicelli confirms the Rosicrucian nature of the Priory of Sion. At the same time their Masonic inner circle and Beringer Sanir seem connected to both. Even if he never was part of Plantard's Priory, which was only created in the 1950s, he did belong to the same initiatic mystery schools. Recent books, such as The Templar Revelation, 1997, by Lynn Picknett and Clive Prince, and Web of Gold, 2000, by Guy Patton and Robin Magnus, have linked the Abbe Sanir with certain secret societies, particularly with Masonic groups that have connections with the Knights Templar and the Rosicrucians. Much of the symbolism in the decoration of the Rennes Chateau Church are open to Masonic interpretation. The journalist Gerard Deceit, in his book, Rennes le Château Le Dossier, Les Imposters, Les Phantasms, Les Hypotheses, 1988, argues that the ninth station of the cross represented in this church contains the symbolism of a Masonic order known as, Chevaliers Bienfaisen de la Cite Saint, a very old and very, elite Masonic body known worldwide with the acronym, CBCS. The anglicized version is Knights Beneficent of the Holy City, KBHC. There are several obediences in this order, which do not officially recognize each other, but in England particularly. Regular membership of CBCS was traditionally restricted to a literal handful of the most senior Knights Templar. However, many English Masons, quite legitimately, took the step of crossing the Channel to Belgium, where membership was more easily obtainable. Recently, in 2007, the Grand Priory of Belgium sanctioned England to work the degrees of the order more openly, forming part of the rectified Scottish Rite, but still in a quite restricted, invitation-only, manner. 
the French researcher Jean Robin claims to have seen evidence of the Masonic membership of Saunier in the archives of the Diocese of Carcassonne, and Antoine Captier believes that the priest was part of the rectified Scottish Rite. A historical note on the English site of the KVHC helps us better understand the Christian nature of the rectified Scottish Rite that has been connected at some point in its history to the Jesuits. It is an acknowledged fact that admission into the rectified Scottish Rite is a privilege which is only extended to brethren of the Temple who have demonstrated by their general demeanor, and qualities of humility and dignity, that they are worthy of consideration for membership of this elite Christian order. The establishment of this select brotherhood evolved after a close examination of the strict observance system founded in 1754 at the Assembly of Lyons held in 1788, under the aegis of the Duke of Brunswick, following which, extensive deliberations resulted in the order being rectified into its present form at the Assembly of Wilhelmsbad in 1782. This distinguished order with its center in Zurich, Switzerland, has continued to the present day, in consequence of which, it can rightfully claim precedence as the most ancient and senior body within the realms of Christian masonry. From the Swedish right environment in recent years, we find Anders Bering Breivik, the well-known terrorist, who was a member of the Oslo Lodge Street, Johannes Lodgen Street, Olaus Chief D. Trey Soiler of the Order of Freemasons of Norway. This is the man who committed the most terrible terrorist attacks in Norwegian history on the 22nd of July, 2011, the day of the Feast of St. Mary Magdalene, a date considered very important to the Knights Templars. Breivik is an example of the latest subversive ideology promoted by the New World Order, and, for this reason, I have dedicated a big space in the last chapter of this book to him. Operating within the extreme right this new ideology openly supports Israel and Judaism. Islam and Christian decadence is something new for the right-wing link to the so-called Priory of Sion, created in the 1950s, which has always been traditionally anti-Semitic, just as most Catholic fundamentalists are. Let's not forget that this is the same network of extremists involved in the strategy of tension in the 70s, secretly manipulated by groups such as the Italian Gladio, part of the Stay Behind operations, which we discussed more specifically in the previous section. They are currently recycling their network for the post-Cold War challenges of the new millennium, with a new and improved collaboration with Israel's intelligence community, as well as the US and the NATO allies. Conclusion Returning to the invisible Rosicrucian College of the Priory of Sion, this ultra-secret body of initiates still guides the Priory in the surviving French aristocracy, adding a touch of the Lima and Crowleyanity to the equation, as Judicelli was for a time involved in a French branch of the OTO. Judicelli states that there are many current French generals from the armed forces still operating within the invisible Rosicrucian College of the Priory, as well as intelligence operatives for both the French military and civilian intelligence, a few religious leaders, and even some famous actors that seem to belong to the mysterious Masonic Association Alpha International. Strangely enough, they are linked not only to Catholic monotheism, but to neo-paganism and the mysterious Druids, which every year celebrate the summer solstice at Stonehenge the famous stone circle that lies at the heart of the Salisbury Plain, in England. This is a place considered of great importance by English Freemasonry, created in England in 1717, and parallel to the emergence of speculative Freemasonry, a modern order of Druids, which included Sir Winston Churchill. So it's not one day that they have been in Asia, they have been there for a long time. They have mingled with the local secret societies, they have been quite uh, active uh, with the Opus Dei, also recently since the establishment of the Opus Dei, which, which was itself another Jesuit creation. Opus Dei, uh -huh. Yeah, the creation of the Jesuits, uh, but uh, still a very powerful creation of the Jesuits, that has taken nowadays uh, itself uh, quite an important position in the pyramid of power, uh. and has substituted at times the Jesuits in some key positions, in, like the banking system, for example. Okay. But the Jesuits stay, stay, stay in firm control, like with Padre Lombardi, of the media of the Vatican. Adolf Nicolas uh, is a dear friend of Thomas Michel, uh, this uh, Jesuit priest that has been involved also with the Fetullah Gulen movement. What's that? Uh, What's the Fetullah Gulen movement? Did well, I say I that right? I would like to finish on Thomas Michel. Okay, now. go ahead. I'm sorry. Go ahead. The Jesuit uh, general uh, Adolf Nicolas, uh, which uh, itself, as I said, uh, was close to Thomas Michel, which was in charge of the of Indonesia. So, being uh, more or less in the same, uh, more or less neighbors, Adolf Nicolas and Thomas Michel have a very 
very close relationship. Uh, at the same time, we know that Adolf Nicolas uh, is uh, somehow different from uh, his uh, predecessor, uh, Hans Kovenbach. Because Hans Kovenbach was uh, definitely probably one of the most evil Jesuit generals uh, we saw in the last uh, few hundred years. <coughs> but at the same time, Padre Pedro Lupe, which was preceding him, was not much better. So they're all really one worse than the other. We, we, we had hope that maybe Padre Lombardi would become the Jesuit general, because uh, I personally, myself, had uh, the possibility of uh, having a close contact with Padre Lombardi, so I was hoping there was a possibility of dialogue uh, of some kind. With, uh, the, with But with Adolf Nicolas, I don't think that dialogue is possible. There is no dialogue with the Jesuits at this moment of time, like in any other time, I think, because they are always trying to operate for the only interest of Rome at heart. Uh -huh. And uh, that's why they colonize uh, with their university, the American intellectual establishment, uh, with places like Georgetown University. And, 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 and they continue to dictate what uh, the elite thinks is the right thing, you know. And then you have the Jesuits that are always trying to convince they are on the right way, doing the right thing, with the right people, all very innocent people, all God-loving people, and they always have a sweet word for you. They kill you with sweetness. That's the Jesuits. Because the Jesuits always know and whatever you tell to him, you know, he's gonna always be there in charge and you're gonna be his subject. So, you can tell them anything. I said to Jesuits, you know, things like, are you sure you want to carry on this interreligious dialogue? I'm not, I don't think so, you're really suitable for it. And they were like, you know, eh, we know we have a bad name, but you know, what can we do? Uh, we are men of God, we struggle. <laughs> yeah, they always... So, the Jesuit is a character, really, of a chameleontic aspect in him living, uh, you know. He's a transformer. They're chameleons. They yeah. take on any form. They take on any form. You can find a Muslim one day, Christian the other, uh, Jew the other, yeah, because also you have a lot of Jesuits that are also double agents for the Zionists. Including, including Father Malachi Martin. Father Malachi Martin was a, a Jesuit double agent. Yeah. That wrote keys of his keys of his blood. Well, he was. Uh, and that was that's the book that he wrote. His yeah, famous. But you know that they have found the receipts of the American Jewish Committee paying him. Um, for that book? Or no, no, paying him. Paying him. Period. Paying him. Period. Wow. Malachi Martin. So Malachi Martin. Because Marike Martin was working uh, for another important, maybe the most important Jesuit uh, uh, conjurer of our times, uh, which is Cardinal Bea. Cardinal Bea, to which the Institute for Judaic Studies is dedicated in the very Jesuit un Gregorian University in Rome. Well, basically, Cardinal Bea is responsible for an act of treason towards the, 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 the Vatican, in a way. No. But that was because they made a deal between the Jesuit and the Zionist, between the Cardinal Bea and the American Jewish Committee. And I think it was Rabbi Ashram, if I don't get it wrong with the name. Okay. But uh, this uh, deal included the fact that they had to uh, pervert the course of things and favor the Jewish nation and the Jewish people. So in the Vatican Council II, this, uh, the, the great manipulator of the Vatican Council was Cardinal Bea. Cardinal Bea, okay. Yes, wow. Cardinal Bea he was uh, the great manipulator. And Malachi Martin was his secretary, or was working for him. Basically. You have double agents, you have double agents, pure and simple. And, and, and obviously it's, it's in the interest of uh, the double agent uh, sometimes to favor uh, one uh, current on the other, depending on uh, who is paying him better, you know. But definitely the, the fact that he has 
uh, criticize the Vatican uh, is, is, is in itself an important aspect because he, uh, he has made many criticisms that are true. Ratzinger is blackmailed by Adolf Nicholas because Adolf Nicholas, like Hans Kovenbach, has uh, and knows very well that uh, Ratzinger, Pope Benedict XVI, had a gay lover, so uh, it was very easy to blackmail him. And, uh, so Ratzinger is a very easy blackmailable puppet. Hmm. So Adolfo Nicholas is really the man of power at this juncture. But also you have Madre Tecla for the nuns. Brigidine. So you have uh, the equal of the Jesuits in the female world, it's called the Brigidine. And Madre Teca is their head, like the Jesuit gender. Okay. And she's a personal friend of Fidel Castro, personal friend uh, of the brother of Fidel Castro is now in control, and that's why he, she organized the, the first paper visit to Cuba. And she was uh, also very important in the recent visit that the, the Vatican arranged in Cuba just when F Castro was leaving the power. You know, why do you think a Vatican representative goes the week Castro is leaving the power? Why? To have a, a Cuban cigar? I mean, you know, obviously it wasn't that the case. Uh, it's because uh, it's passing on the power, it has to be always monitored by the Vatican. Um, let me ask you a question. Why did Hans Kolvenbach step down? What information do you have on that? Thomas Michel, when I met him last year in May in Oslo, the secretary of the Interreligious Dialogue of the, of the Jesuits, which is the second person really most powerful in the Jesuits, he told me that uh, for the first time uh, somebody was stepping down, because usually they die in the position of Jesuit general. They don't step down. He said that Hans Kovenbach uh, like, was very old and uh, he was uh, getting increasingly tired and uh, I think wants to retire in Lebanon uh, to work uh, on the Middle East uh, more closely and uh, probably usher some more mayhem down there. <laughs> I don't know. Hans Kovenbach definitely is not dead. Is still alive and still uh, probably very much in charge of a few things, including the media of the Vatican, which is in the hands of Padre Lombardi, which was supposed to become himself the Jesuit general at this time, but didn't. And, uh, but well, the most powerful people in the Jesuits at the moment are Adolf Nicholas, then you have Padre Lombardi, then you have Thomas Michel. Hans Kovenbach in the background still there. Okay. These are the key people in the Jesuits today.